Thank you, Frida, and thanks, Harriet, for inviting me to speak today. It falls to me to talk to you about a lady whose name is probably the least well-known among those being discussed here today. Isabella, later shortened to Ella Ovenden, was born in 1877 in this city to Charles Ovenden and his wife, Isabella Robinson. Her father was Church of Ireland rector in Bushmills, County Antrim, and later Dean of St. Patrick's Cathedral here in Dublin. She was schooled in Alexandra College, then on Earth for Terrace, Queen's College London, and finally in Göttingen, Germany. Graduating in 1899 with a science degree from the Royal University of Ireland, she entered the Catholic University School of Medicine, seen here on Cecilia Street in Temple Bar. The building lives on, although its role has changed more than a little. <laughs> Isabella qualified in 1904, the earliest female student to achieve first place in the final medical examinations of the Royal. The university magazine, St. Stephen's, commented, it was a record to gain it over so many competitors of the sterner sex, which until recently regarded medicine as exclusively its own ground, which they did. She won a traveling scholarship to Vienna and was awarded an MD in 1906. Writing the following year as Ella Ovenden in Open Doors for Irish Women, a guide to the professions open to educated women in Ireland, she outlined the qualities required by any woman wishing to become a doctor, of which, in her view, the most important was love of the work. She opined that possession, prior to commencing medical studies of a degree preferably in science, was advantageous. Look at graduate entry to medicine today. She discussed the cost of training, including living expenses. Regarding remuneration, she remarked that the medical profession was not one which gave, as she put it, quick returns to women in particular. She stated, however, that prospects were improving as the woman doctor took a more established place in the community but that her position would only be secure if she showed that she had taken up medicine not as a fad, but as a serious scientific or philanthropic undertaking. In December 1907, she married George Webb, philosopher, mathematician, and fellow of Trinity College, Dublin. His best man on the day was Thomas Gilman Moorhead, future president of this college. Over the next few years, Ella Webb combined rearing a family with private practice and running a free evening dispensary or clinic in Kevin Street. She also worked as a demonstrator of anatomy in the women's department of Trinity College Medical School, as a physiology demonstrator in Cecilia Street, and taught on a sanitary and applied hygiene course in Trinity, which sought to prepare young women for such posts as lady factory inspectors, sanitary inspectors, and teachers of hygiene. The Women's National Health Association, or WNHA, was set up in 1907 by Lady Aberdeen, wife of John Campbell Hamilton Gordon, Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. It focused on finding ways to eradicate tuberculosis by coordinating pasteurized milk distribution and opening healthcare centers. It also tried to address the social conditions and issues surrounding the extremely high infant mortality rates that at the time existed in Ireland, most particularly in Dublin City. Webb was involved from the outset. One of the main ways that the WNHA tried to educate mothers was through its traveling exhibition. She played an active role in this. This exhibition visited between 80 and 90 locations from Donegal to Waterford and attracted large crowds. She also worked on a voluntary basis in at least two babies clubs 
including this one on St. Augustine Street in the Liberties, run under the auspices of the association. In addition to having free doctor's clinics for infants, these clubs aimed to assist mothers in the care of their babies by holding classes on cooking, home hygiene, and sewing. She was a firm advocate of breastfeeding, and in 1913 published an analysis of why 200 mothers in her own practice commenced to breastfeed, but then abandoned it. She went on to outline the measures which, in her view, might be taken to bring about an improvement in the matter. Now, like Kathleen Lynn and Madeleine French Mullen, Ella Webb saw action during the 1916 Rising, but in a different capacity. As Lady District Superintendent in the St. John Ambulance Brigade, she took command of, and within three hours, transformed the St. John headquarters at 40 Merrion Square into a temporary emergency hospital. Thereafter, she worked in the hospital and cycled repeatedly through the firing lines to attend there and at other St. John locations. She kept a diary of events during the week. Saturday, April 29th, frightfully heavy firing in the morning. A girl was killed at a window in Upper Mount Street, sent in two VADs to lay her out. Afternoon quiet. Heard that the leaders had given in. Also, that Dr. Kathleen Lynn was a prisoner. Sunday, April 30th, 8 a.m. to St. Matthias, her church, then to hospital. One case had been brought in and died. Didn't like the look of the boy with the knee, so rang up E. Taylor, this was Edward Taylor, surgeon to Sir Patrick Dunn's hospital, who amputated the leg. Boy greatly improved. Firing at Hatch Street, where she lived, was frightful. In recognition of her Easter week efforts, she was awarded an MBE in 1918. She continued to write and was the author of an important 1917 paper in the Dublin Journal of Medical Science on maternity and child welfare in Dublin. It was one that was regularly cited in both medical and government publications over the following year, few years. Now, back in 1887, the Adelaide Hospital on Peter Street, now of course part of Tala Hospital, had been the first in Ireland to appoint a doctor to a designated post of anaesthetist. The man concerned, Paul Peel, is seen here in about 1895 at the head of the operating table. Believe me, the, the view from there is always much better than that from the side. By early 1918, Peel had served for 31 years and it was time to retire. At a meeting of the medical board on January 15th, it was suggested that Ella Webb be appointed in his place. This was agreed and it was also decided that Dr. Webb should be told that if she continued to like the anaesthetic work and was successful at it, the board would be glad if she would undertake a dispensary for children to be held once a week. This to continue only while she was anaesthetist to the hospital. She was the first female to be appointed as anaesthetist to any hospital on this island and also the first to be appointed to the Adelaide medical staff. Webb's work in the dispensary reinforced her belief that many of the diseases she saw in children were caused or exacerbated by poverty and malnutrition. She laid great emphasis on the child's social circumstances and at a meeting of the Red Cross Society in 1919 appealed for a former voluntary aid detachment nurse or similar who might help her in addressing this aspect of her patient's care. Winifred Alcock, who had been training as an almoner in London, but had returned to Ireland for family reasons, responded to her plea and was appointed honorary lady almoner to the Adelaide. As Webb interviewed children and their parents, Alcock sat at the same table, 
making notes of their social conditions, and soon began what was an entirely new arrangement for this country of visiting them in their own homes. The hospital report for 1922 detailed exa examples of her work, which included home visits, arranging food and convalescence, development of a remedial class for children with speech defects, obtaining surgical appliances, and gaining the cooperation of outside agencies. 2,300 visits to 889 families, some carried out by volunteer friends of Alcox, were recorded in that year alone. Now, of course, St. Alton's Hospital had opened three years earlier. Ella Webb wasn't at the initial meetings that led to its foundation. The earliest mention of her name that I have found in connection with it is in Kathleen Lynn's diary entry for January 28, 1919. I'm not absolutely sure what Lynn meant by came over HOSP, whether Webb and Solomons had come to see 37 Charlemagne Street or alternatively to discuss it, perhaps at another location. But one way or the other, two weeks later, Lynn wrote, saw Dr. Webb 12.30, she will come on staff of HOSP. When one considers on the one hand Webb's record in caring for the mothers and children of inner city Dublin over the years, and on the other, the aspirations of Lynn, Madeleine French Mullen, and others, where St. Alton's was concerned, she must surely have been considered to be a most valuable addition to the medical staff. The information that I have concerning her contribution to the hospital comes mainly from an examination of material held here in the college, the St. Alton's archive and Lynn's diaries. It is clear that once she had made a commitment to the institution, she became actively involved. Kathleen Lynn wrote on March 4th that Webb, among others, was covering number 37, as she referred to it. The minutes of a hospital executive committee meeting held on May 28th refer to a discussion on a meeting to be held in the Mansion House on June 4th to open a subscription list for the hospital. The speakers were to be the Lord Mayor of Dublin, a prominent businessman, a senior judge, and Ella Webb, the only doctor on the list. The first meeting of the medical committee, later renamed the medical board, took place on June 30th, and she was elected chairman. This was the term used, and she held the position for the following six years. In her work at St. Alton's, and also in her dispensary at the Adelaide, she treated many cases of childhood rickets. In 1919, the precise etiology of the condition was still uncertain, but Webb had no doubt that the appalling living conditions and diets of many of her young patients in the tenements of Dublin slums were a major contributory factor. Sunlight was promoted for prevention and healing, and the St. Alton's annual report for 1923 stated that the infant patients were exposed to it all year round. I quote, our babies have been out in the sunshine all through the winter months. They have been kept warm and comfortable in their flannel bags and have derived much benefit from the air and sun. And as Anne has just mentioned, this was how they did it. Um, I don't know how many of you remember the, um, the old drifters hit up on the roof. The, uh, no, a sea of blank faces. Uh, rest easy, I'm not going to try and sing it for you. The discovery that same year that a form of artificial light, ultraviolet, could provide the same protection as sunlight was of particular significance in northern European countries. The importance of this finding was recognized by Ella Webb, and she soon began to use UV light treatment in her own home. She went further and later wrote, in the year 1923, I was so much struck with the futility of my own treatment of rickets that I determined something must be done about it. I was fortunate enough to arouse the interest 
and enlist the sympathy of a friend who was willing to give some financial assistance to the extent of £250 a year until we got established. Through St. John Ambulance, she knew a lady named Leticia Overend, seen here on the right with Webb on the left, and it may have been she who was providing the £250 per year. Overend was the daughter of a wealthy Dublin solicitor and farmer. The family lived at Airfield, near Dundrum. The Airfield estate, bequeathed to Ireland in the 1990s, has a working farm to this day, the closest one to Dublin city centre, and is also a visitor, a visitor attraction. Leticia was well known in the neighbourhood. She purchased a Rolls Royce Phantom in 1927. And um, this image is in fact a still from a television, as it was then, interview with her in the 1960s. She drove and serviced her car, which is now on display at Airfield until not long before her death at 97 years of age in 1977. And I have my own childhood memories, I'm not going to tell you how far back they go, um, of seeing the rich lady driving around Stroorgan and Dundrum in her fancy car um, way back when. Ella Webb was aware, well aware, that her rickets patients could not be permanently cured without adequate food and care after hospital treatment. This was often not available at home. She and her friend explored the possibility of finding somewhere to look after them. Both ladies had attended Alexandra College. They enlisted the help of fellow past pupils and a fundraising committee was formed. Overend's uncle provided a massive impetus by donating £5,000 towards the project. The group searched in vain for suitable premises and eventually decided that it would make more sense to build their own. In 1924, the board of Stillorgan Convalescent Home offered to lease a field to them, and a wooden bungalow-type house with two wards, each with a south-facing veranda, was planned. The Children's Sunshine Home opened in March 1925. Ella Webb was chairman and principal medical officer from the opening until her death over 20 years later. So by 1925, Webb was heavily committed to the Sunshine Home, was working in St. Alton's, was an anesthetist to the Adelaide, and continued to run a children's dispensary there. I believe that she was still attending at least one babies club, and she was certainly still volunteering with St. John Ambulance. As if all that weren't enough, she and her family were living in Hoth, quite some distance from her various workplaces. Something had to give, and did. Towards the end of that year, a letter from her to St. Alton's Medical Board was read, in which she tendered her resignation from the hospital due to pressure of work elsewhere. But she didn't cut her links completely. The annual report for 1925 noted we are very sorry indeed to lose the benefit of her services. However, we have her assurance of cooperation and help whenever possible, especially in the matter of artificial sunlight treatment. She has very kindly offered to treat our babies at her house until we are possessors of a lamp of our own. Eleven months after leaving St. Alton's, Webb wrote to the Adelaide Hospital wishing to step down as an anaesthetist, but to retain her children's dispensary. She was informed that the one position depended on the other and was asked to withdraw her resignation. Following months of further correspondence, her wish was eventually granted. She appears to have been a perfectly capable anaesthetist, although one 13 years old boy Admitted to the Adelaide for surgery for appendicitis, appears to have had some reservations. He later wrote, 
It was August 1922, and I clearly remember the deaths of Arthur, Arthur Griffith on the 12th and of Michael Collins on the 22nd. More vividly personal is the memory of being put to sleep by Dr. Ella Webb. She muttered as I, swaddled from head to toe in white theater garb, was laid wide awake on the altar of the operating table. Is this a boy or a girl? With this final insult, I was smothered by the ether. My recovery was un uneventful. Who was this boy? Well, his name will be familiar to many of you, and a few among you may, in fact, have known him. David Mitchell, who was to become president of this college in the late 1960s, and later wrote a most readable history of the hospital in which many years previously he had had his appendix removed. Following her resignation as anaesthetist, Webb continued her children's dispensary for a further two years, departing the Adelaide for good in March 1929. But look, an entry in Kathleen Lynn's diary from the previous month. Once back at St. Alton's, Webb resumed where she had left off. In addition to caring for inpatients, she ran a dispensary, initially on Saturdays, apparently because that was the only working day on which she had the time. Thomas Gilman Moorhead mentioned earlier was RCPI president in the early 1930s and also a St. Dalton's board member. At his suggestion, she involved herself in postgraduate education in paediatrics and later became an active participant in the discussions regarding the proposed merger of St. Dalton's with the National Children's Hospital in Harcourt Street. In 1935, Ella Webb published the first 10 years experience at the Sunshine Home. She outlined the steps taken that resulted in its opening and then described the management of rickets there. This varied depending on whether the disease was acute or chronic, but generally included either rest or gentle exercise, massage, a diet rich in vitamin D, exposure to light, either sunlight or artificial, and occasional referral for surgery. The children were nursed out of doors on the verandas as much as possible, often for 24 hours a day in summertime, and were kept warm with blankets, hot water bottles, and so on. The cure rate in 477 admitted over 10 years was 56%, with most of the remainder showing improvement. Webb attributed better results in the later years to earlier referral as the work of the home became more widely known. Now, as you all know, Ireland's neutrality during World War II didn't prevent food shortages and rationing. Webb became concerned about the unavailability of good sources of vitamin C, such as obviously oranges. She was a keen gardener and was aware that rose hips, although very unpalatable, were an excellent alternative source, and prepared a liquid concentrate from them in her own home for use in St. Alton's, and I imagine also the Sunshine Home. This couldn't last forever, and in 1944, she reported to St. Alton's Medical Board on discussions she had on the commercial manufacture of vitamin C with the Dublin jam makers, Lamb Brothers, perhaps better known to most of you as the originator of the brand name Fruitfield Jam. The company did, in fact, go on to produce a rose hip jelly for a number of years afterwards. By this time, Webb's health was failing. She continued to work in both St. Alton's and the Sunshine Home and as a volunteer with the St. John Ambulance Brigade, until shortly before her death, aged 69 years from cerebral thrombosis and heart failure, 
on April 24th, 1946. Numerous obituaries and appreciations attested not only to her professional skill, cheery countenance and vitality, wise counsel and practical common sense, but also to her small kindnesses, not just to patients and their families, but also to friends and colleagues. Uh, today, is of course, primarily about St. Dalton's, but I thought I might conclude with a, a few words about the Sunshine Home in the years after Webb's death. It is considered to have been her major legacy. In 1953, it located to premises almost directly across the road. By this time, rickets had become less common, and numerous cases of tuberculosis and, and post-operative congenital heart disease were being admitted. Ten years later, the focus had shifted again, and there were many bed-bound children, often with spina bifida and hydrocephalus. By the late 1970s, Severe int severely intellectually handicapped patients were being accommodated. This service soon expanded to also include the physically handicapped. The Children's Sunshine Home Hospice Project was launched in 2005 and merged a year later with the Laura Lynn Children's Hospice Foundation, established by Jane and Brendan McKenna following the deaths of their daughters, Laura and Lynn, from congenital heart disease and leukemia, respectively. Laura Lynn House, the first children's hospital hospice in this country, opened on a site adjacent to the Sunshine Home in 2011. It has eight palliative care beds and four family accommodation units. Laura Lynn also continues to provide long-term residential care to a small number of children and young adults with profound physical and intellectual dis disabilities. I leave you with a final quote from the subject of my talk. And I trust you'll agree that Ella Webb more than lived up more both before and after making it to this promise that she made 97 years ago. Thank you for listening.